Good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, give you a warm welcome to the best uh, session. So you have chosen the right room and the right date because we have a great uh, group of people here. My name is Jose Manuel Leceta. I'm chair of the Insight Foresight Institute in Madrid. And um, we'd like to make this session interesting. And uh, as time is short, we thought you know, we better go through an experiment, a social experiment. Uh, if we manage to get this uh, event, an experiential event for the speakers, I'm convinced this could also be engaging and uh, stimulating for the participants. So again, thanks for joining today. I'd like to uh, spend a couple of minutes only to frame a little bit the, uh, the discussion we'd like to have with you. Uh, you have seen uh, entering the room and the, uh, and the building the motto of the conference, Citizens for Citizens. Sorry, cities for citizens. And uh, we'd like to turn around this motto, uh, citizens by citizens. Because if we talk about innovation, uh, we believe, and I, this is a strong belief, innovation has to do uh, finally and ultimately with people. And this is also true when you talk about citizens and cities. Uh, people are the drivers of innovation. And if there is any change to be inspired, it has to really link with the human side of things. Uh, so that's why I would like to take you to this uh, uh, discussion with these peoples in mind, uh, people-driven innovation or power to the people if we want to activate innovation in cities. Uh, so again, we'd like to have this discussion with you, and we thought that maybe uh, splitting uh, the hour we had ahead of us in, in two halves. First half would be a discussion or a, present a series of presentations, uh, but against a framework I could uh, go through briefly, and then the second half to really go into a discussion mode. And uh, we, you have the opportunity also to put questions. So uh, we will have uh, an iPad uh, by the end of the uh, session uh, with the questions that you have uh, put forward and those that become most popular. So please use this device because we would like to really uh, uh, illuminate the audience because now you are in darkness, we are in the light. But we would like to illuminate also the room uh, with uh, whoever has a good idea. Nobody has the monopoly of good ideas. So if we are consistent with this idea of uh, citiz by citizens, you are all citizens. So please help us uh, to engage in the conversation later. So the framework, because there is nothing most useful than a good theory, comes from a professor in Babson in the US, uh, whose name is uh, Daniel Eisenberg. Uh, but you know, there is also evidence in the OCD countries that those uh, nations that are engaging on the one hand, setting up startups, you know, encouraging people to take the knowledge in their hands, do something, setting up a venture on the one hand. And then on the other hand, going to the macro level of reforms for policy, for taxes, for markets, do not get really to the growth, you know, that is expected. So just focusing on the two streams, the micro level and the, and the micro level, is not actually working. So we need this kind of meso level, which we call it ecosystem which, again, for many, is the closest thing to a, to a city. And if we talk particularly about entrepreneurship-driven innovation, so innovation that happens through people and on vehicles, new ventures, this has to do certainly with cities, which for many are laboratories of innovation. So these are the uh, domains, uh, like in a, you know, in a paella or any uh, cooking. You need the ingredients, right? But you need also the recipe. What you see here are the ingredients. Uh, according to this framework of, that this professor, by the way, has put in place in a number of countries, like Colombia, for instance, Manizales. So uh, Daniel Eisenberg has managed to activate, really, the ecosystem in that city, which is now a good practice for the World Bank. So you see these domains here. What I would like to do with the contribution of the five speakers we have, and I, I thank them very much, really, for joining, is to go through these uh, dimensions and then reflect with us what their experience actually has been. You know, against these six uh, domains, what they have seen in their practice of useful for the activation of the ecosystem. Later, we'll see uh, what the uh, functions are to really activate the ecosystem, and I just, you know, rush through this here. Uh, this would serve us to go into the discussion mode later. But again, first of all, I'd like to give the word to uh, the participants here, uh, starting with uh, Kate. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining. Uh, you have gone through the Atlantic, so it's a bit farther away than for the rest of us, particularly myself. Thanks for joining, and please, the, the floor is all yours. 
Thank you, Jose Manuel, and good morning. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. I wanted to start off by just going through a little bit of background on what we're doing in New York City right now. In, in New York, we, we have one of our fastest growing industries is, of course, our tech industry. Um, and within the city's Economic Development Corporation, where I um, lead efforts relating to innovation and experimentation, our goal is to link our anchor industries with emerging technologies across all aspects of hyphen tech. So that's anything from health tech to fintech to even fashion tech. And we want to make sure that we're supporting an entrepreneurial ecosystem at every stage of growth. Um, within New York City, there are 300,000 people employed by the tech sector. We, we have over $7 billion of venture capital flowing into New York City. We're very competitive, though second to Silicon Valley, so that's, that's always something that, that we're focusing on. And after the financial crisis of 2008, the, the hard lessons that, that we all learned were the needs for the diversification of our economy and really identifying where are the strengths in our anchor industries and how can we help bridge the gap between them and innovative entrepreneurs and make sure that they survive in these emerging economies that have really changed the face of the nature of the work that, that they've been doing. In New York City, we, we certainly face some infrastructure challenges, like, like every aging city. Um, our subway signals and sewers are on average more than 70 years old. Um, we have a population of 8.5 million people. We have 56 million tourists visit us every year, so there are a lot of stressors on our city. Those stressors and challenges, of course, create opportunities for new technical innovations to address these urban challenges. And New Yorkers consume a billion gallons of drinking water every day. Um, we generate 23,000 tons of waste every single day. This will certainly be relevant to a lot of the circular economy discussions that we're all having in parallel sessions. How do we promote innovative market-driven solutions to these problems of our linear economy and converting that to a circular economy? And so in New York, we have a tremendous market um, that, that promotes growth. We have a $1.5 million sanitation budget, a $15 billion energy spend. We have a million buildings that are responsible for about 75% of our, our greenhouse gas emissions. And so the policy drivers that, that we've put into place are, are wonderful drivers for market supply and demand forces at work. Um, we have very ambitious goals of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the year 2050. We have a zero waste goal to achieve, achieve zero waste to landfills by the year 2030. These are very aggressive goals. And what we want to do is match these aggressive and ambitious goals with incentives and drivers so that urban innovators can meet the demands. And that's through innovating new technologies and through a cross-pollination across all sectors to make sure that those, those technologies can, can be advanced. And I think that another key thing is that we serve as a global hub for innovation. Um, we have 300,000 tech jobs in New York City. We also have the largest university student population in the country. We have more than 110 colleges and universities in New York City. So that talent pipeline is, is critical. And what we want to ensure is that we retain that talent in New York City and that the people that we educate in our world-class institutions stay within New York and apply those skills and talents to emerging hyphen tech economies within the city. We have some, some really interesting examples of uh, our explosive growth in both hardware and software. And over the past few years, many, many years ago, we started an incubator network um, in order to foster the growth of startups across multiple sectors. The lessons that we learned from those incubators were that the incubators, regardless of sector, that are affiliated with a very strong institution, typically a university, are the ones that thrive and are able to be sustainable after government support has ceased. And our goal is to spin up these efforts and then make them sustainable, independent of government in the long term. And our next stage has been that we've moved on from the incubator stage and now are fostering the growth of growth stage companies 
in hubs that are devoted to smart city software, smart city hardware, and advanced manufacturing technologies like 3D printing, robotics, CNC routers. And so our goal is to convene everyone so that they can share ideas within a shared space, that we can catalyze investment of capital into these companies, and really catalyzing the talent in New York City so that there are avenues for that job growth, and that these small companies, a minimum of, of five employees, are not leaving New York City due to the real estate pressures but that we're finding them a space in order to capitalize on all of the advantages that New York City has to offer. Thank you. Thank you very much also, Kate, for being that in time. Uh, <laughs> I guess we have to do the same with the mayor of New York, right, to be in time. So thanks very much for this. Uh, we like, uh, I'd like now to invite Miranda Sharp, who is also uh, active in this domain, uh, in the other side of the Atlantic, in this side of the Atlantic, the UK, right? So please uh, join in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Manuel. Um, I'm Miranda Sharp. I work for the Ordnance Survey, which is the UK's national mapping agency. We were set up 200 years ago when the English government or the English military was worried about both the French and the Scottish simultaneously. And you'll notice that times have changed rapidly since then. For a country that covers only less than 1% of the world's surface area, we hold um, the largest geodetic geospatial database in the world. It's got over half a billion components. Um, and that, that large database enables us to interrelate data in the way that 200 years ago people used maps as a frictionless exchange uh, for the frictionless exchange of information. When we're involved in smart city projects, we're involved in challenging the, the, the scope of that data so that people can bring, come together and, and achieve better outcomes for their place. We're also involved in making the, those solutions interoperable um, so that they can exist both across the Great Britain and, and, and in the wider world. And I'll talk a bit about those in a, in a moment. Um, but when we look at cities, and when I look at cities, and, you know, we see the complex laboratories of change uh, that Jose Manuel talked about. We're also looking at crucibles where the pro problems are concentrated, uh, where there's congestion and overcrowding in the teeth of, adv of advancing, as, as Kate referred to, uh, of advancing in uh, difficult climate change goals, um, and with governments that have less and less money to spend. Um, and, but that is bring, working together with the enthusiasm, enthusiasm of populations uh, to solve the common problems um, uh, and, and, uh, and, the, and the nimble startups uh, to, to, to come together. Um, and there's a couple of uncomfortable truths in cities. Private sector needs to make money and the public sector needs to be careful with that money. And we see those two, those two uh, I, I, we saw those two um, problems coming, coming together. And so when I was given the opportunity by Jose Manuel to prepare for this interactive and excellent session, um, he sent us the diagram and asked us to look at the different levers that need to be in place and the different communities that need to be engaged in order to, to produce a successful outcome and a successful project. And we have been involved with many smart city projects across um, the UK, both, um, uh, all, all over, uh, many of which Brandon will talk about later. Um, but the one that we, I want to talk about most of all is the one in Manchester, which is an Internet of Things demonstrator. It's a city-scale demonstrator. Um, the UK Innovation Agency has put in um, £10 million as a, as a, as a, as a, as a part of seed funding. Um, but we're collaborating across 27 partners, the people that are encompassing um, academia, um, educators, incubators, um, corporations, both large and small, and opinion of, of, uh, informal opinion leaders, people who do arts projects. Um, and so when I looked at the paper, I understood that this was a project that has a great, greater opportunity for success because of the way it engages the whole community for the whole community. Um, and uh, if I talk about just one example, is the much maligned talking bus stop. Um, the, this is a piece of technology that has emerged and uh, when, when these, these people brought together the, and were looking at the use cases for it, um, they, they started to be able to describe how that could benefit different people in different ways. Um, so for, for a start, we can send our vulnerable adult or our child to a bus stop and know that they've arrived there safely. And in the event of an emergency, that talking bus stop, we can communicate with the, with the authorities so that sensible decisions can be made about evacuation and control of a population. And because the bus stop has, has information um, around about how many people are there, they will ultimately make uh, smarter decisions um, about the long-term infrastructure planning. 
So I, I, I thank the panel for the opportunity to, dis, to look at the projects we're involved on in a new and, and different way. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miranda. Uh, this is also interesting. Eh? Challenges uh, into opportunities. And this has to do, again, a lot with entrepreneurship. You know, this is what entrepreneurs do. Uh, they drive in uh, difficult uh, environments and uh, create value. Uh, this is precisely, I think, what the rest of the speakers can help us also dive into. And uh, we'll start now with Brandon Davito, who is uh, uh, active in the Silver Springs Network. Uh, so please. Great, and hopefully I can uh, duck in between the, the construction behind us and, and you'll be able to hear me. So cities really see a connected future, and we've seen uh, this trend emerging where cities are looking for open platforms to be able to innovate, to bring in new devices, new experiences, and new applications so that they can deliver a better service to their citizens. Um, that, that future will be cheaper, it'll be more efficient, and there'll be a broader range of services either delivered by cities or by third parties on top of the platforms that cities are choosing today. And we'll talk a little bit about how cities are thinking more in terms of platforms um, that allow open e innovation, new device ecosystems, new partner ecosystems um, that are able to rapidly change the way that citizens experience the civic sphere. Getting there isn't easy. It requires a, a set of partnerships and collaboration across a range of, of entities and actors who normally don't work together. Um, our background, we work with very large cities and utilities um, to deploy smart technologies. And what we're really starting to see is that the, the lines blur between what a utility will provide, what a city provides, and then also what the third party, um, what private sector is able to provide in terms of new services to citizens. Um, and we really um, are making an effort around driving citizen engagement to make sure that the new services are, um, are benefiting them and, and changing the way that they interact with cities um, and their experience in an urban sphere. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the, um, some case studies of successful partnerships. Um, here in Europe, Copenhagen is, is often pointed out as, as one of the leading smart cities. Um, there's, we have a project in place where the city is, has made an investment in a smart lighting platform um, to upgrade and install 20,000 new LED controllers. But they're not just looking at a single application. Um, they're thinking very much about how that investment can then spur broader innovation um, and working with a number of private as well as public entities to be able to create small incubators where new technology can be tested and proven before it's rolled out to a broader sphere. Um, so some examples of this are the, the Danish Outdoor Lighting Laboratory, or DAL, uh, Copenhagen Solutions Lab, um, and many other places where new technologies that address the specific use cases in Copenhagen um, in many cases, it's around bicyclists, where over half the population cycles to work and uh, is part of their daily lives, and ensuring that those trips are safe and secure. Um, so an example is using the existing lighting network to monitor the presence of, of cyclists in a, in a bicycle lane, raising the light levels as the cyclist approaches an intersection, and actually changing the signals so that there's a green wave where cyclists can move much more freely throughout the city. Um, having those types of really rich experiences that improve citizen lives um, and make traffic safer um, is a big part of the, the investment thesis as part of uh, Copenhagen's lighting project. Another is in Chicago where um, the local utility ComEd has partnered with the local university um, to create new business opportunities. Um, so Illinois Institute of Technology is focused on three different areas around public safety, EV chargers, and water meters as new types of devices that can be incubated and actually the, the various foundation partners are, actually, are funding um, development from students that go into an incubator lab on campus and then are transitioned um, not only to Chicago but also worldwide um, where these, these new market opportunities can take flight um, and really scale up as they, uh, as they go beyond the concept phase. The last uh, example is Bristol. Um, so Bristol has a, has a number of great universities and, um, and much of the talent coming out of um, Bristol University actually leaves to London. So what they're interested in doing is, is using an investment in an IoT network as a way to spur local business development. Um, and so through Bristol is Open, which is a, um, a, uh, a partnership between the city, the university, um, and then a, uh, a third party, 
they've been able to encourage innovation um, where students are able to build new applications, have access to an IoT network, so a, a medium bandwidth as well as a very high bandwidth um, network to create new applications, incubate them for applications like traffic, parking, air pollution, and many others. Um, and then be able to take those as a model into other cities. And they've developed informal partnerships with cities like Hong Kong and elsewhere um, to be able to scale these opportunities and business ideas up broadly uh, throughout the world. And then coming back to that point of making sure that cities are engaging and personal um, is the Playable Cities effort. And this is on many of the streetlights in Bristol, there is a video camera that's tracking shadows. Um, so as you walk underneath a, a streetlight, it actually records your shadow, and as you pass, it plays it back. And just that simple thing has become a really interactive way of making the promise of smart technology really real for, uh, for citizens. And so as more and more people um, are, were aware of this and the word spread, you started to see conga lines of friends getting together and dancing underneath the lights, um, and the shadows would come and play back from, um, as they passed. Or having the dogs uh, that you can see in the picture here, uh, dogs and humans starting to play in these shadows, um, just really brought the, the immersive experience and the rich interaction between um, new technologies and a city sphere that hasn't happened in the past. So looking forward to your questions later. Thank you. So this is the technology we will be using. Eh? So watch out because we will be spotting light <laughs> on the audience. Just kidding. But thanks to give a human touch to uh, what the cities are actually uh, mean, meaning in terms of innovation and so on. To continue with this precisely, we have a leader country uh, and, uh, representative from Estonia, Thomas Turk, who is active in the science park uh, in, in your country. So please join in. Hola, Barcelona. Um, first, I would like to start and um, ask from the audience how many of you have been to Estonia? Please raise your hand. Oh, quite a many of you. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, I would like to share um, in my presentation uh, the use cases that we have. And um, um, of course, um, we can talk a, a lot about uh, challenges we have in each country. And Estonia is, uh, is like a city of uh, 1.3 million only living there. Uh, we are also a uh, shortage of talent and capital. But um, how to build um, uh, use cases and um, uh, smart economy? Um, there is one case, we call it a Startup Estonia program. And um, this is not only starting with um, um, scaling up uh, the very uh, famous and uh, fast growing um, uh, startup, but it's also about how to engage uh, the citizens, as we call the citizens for the city, uh, to uh, give us ideas and how to uh, look at like a process for them to uh, uh, start from this idea phase to uh, go through different um, upsides and downsides of uh, developing startups and um, ending up with this uh, validation scaling and establishing the businesses globally. And uh, this is a good example uh, from Estonia. We have uh, uh, several uh, very nice uh, uh, unicorn case studies already that um, uh, can change uh, not only the uh, Europe or the uh, new um, Nordic countries that we are coming from, but it's also something for the global economy, and this uh, is also important. The one point I would like to emphasize is um, also the government, uh, which can be uh, and play a very important part of uh, developing uh, such uh, use cases. And um, in our case, we have this uh, e-residency program. So if you haven't heard about this, please uh, Google and check it out. It's something maybe good for your business because it allows you to do a global business um, through our digital services. It also allows uh, uh, to use our uh, different services for digital signature, for example. And uh, it's very easy to establish a business this way. You can just um, need more than, uh, no more than 15 minutes and uh, also start a bank account, for example, which is a brand new feature we have. Um, what else can it uh, make a difference is that, um, for example, from this process point of view, um, Estonia is also um, very much uh, would like to uh, make the change in a shared economy. So if you're, for example, a Uber driver, all your taxes uh, after the ride um, will be declared automatically to the tax office. This is something new, something very interesting for the others as well. 
and of course cross-border business. Um, we see a lot of challenges uh, that um, and we saw this way that um, this cross-border digital signature uh, projects uh, can take off. Or, for example, uh, you know, San Francisco Bay Area, we also call Tallinn and Helsinki, uh, Talsinki Bay Area. So um, could be there another tunnel um, and uh, connect with a uh, new uh, Silk Road, um, which will be established through Finland or some other European countries. Or there are so many t uh, other digital society um, projects to um, uh, describe. So the three key takeaways uh, from my side is that if you look at the ecosystem to build it, then it's more like a value chain. It's a value chain for the citizens. It's a value chain for the different uh, businesses and also uh, governments, for example. And um, it's also uh, great to look through uh, the way how the processes are defined. So the design thinking of processes is very important. And um, what um, made us successful, because we have this, um, for example, IT card system for 15 years now, is also to see the public-private partnership. So if there are great ideas from the public sector and combined with uh, very great ideas from the private sector, this can be a, a huge success. And um, last thing is also important that uh, we see ourselves also like a test country. So if you want to challenge us, please do that. Uh, we are very much open for that. We, would like to uh, give you this uh, test prep facilities and um, yeah, thank you so much. So. Thank you, Thomas. I think we will be uh, having all the elements ready for the discussion now, but to conclude with uh, this first round, I'd like to invite uh, Tim Turito from Microsoft Worldwide Public Sector. This is a fascinating case of a company that was focused on products and is now service oriented. So please help us uh, investigate what this means also for our theme. So uh, thank you, Jose Manuel. It's always, it's always difficult going last because you, uh, you see all these great ideas and great speakers up there have all these examples. So um, I always worry about what I'm going to say. Um, but you know, I think I'll probably take a little bit of a, of a different tact right here. And, and in my role uh, from a global perspective, I see a lot of innovation ecosystems. And, and rather than point out the specifics of any, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what are the characteristics uh, an innovation ecosystem needs to have in order to be successful. Uh, and I think first, it needs to be built on trust. Uh, and by trust, I mean, uh, uh, what I mean by that is all parties need to be working together. Uh, and, and that trust isn't about transparency. I, I, I stress the word working together. And so the parties that usually involved, we, we, need, we talk about public and private partnerships a lot, uh, and public sector and private sector, but, but involving the citizens as part of that innovation ecosystem is very important too. And that's what helps uh, build trust among all the parties. Uh, the next thing is I think those ecosystems have to be inclusive. Uh, and certainly uh, when I talk or think about inclusiveness, uh, there's a short-term uh, uh, impact to the ecosystem in the long term. And, and looking towards the long term, I think we have to build an educational system uh, that encourages our young minds uh, to be uh, entrepreneurial, to be innovative. And I think that starts very early uh, in the ecosystem of education uh, to be inclusive among uh, across our genders and our minorities. And then lastly, I think our, our innovations have to be and our ecosystem have to be responsible. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times uh, we get really, really focused on, on asking ourselves whether or not we can uh, or could, and, and we don't focus on whether or not we should. Uh, and so as we innovate, we need to be aware of things like uh, job displacement uh, as we innovate, putting people out of jobs uh, and making sure we don't uh, uh, not have a path to re-educate or retrain those folks. Uh, we need to make sure our innovations are accessible by all parties involved. And so. Uh, rather than running ahead and, and just making sure we can develop some of the things with, with these great bells and whistles, we need to make sure that our ecosystems are, are, are building trust, inclusiveness, and, and, and responsible. And so, and so the other thing, you know, as I go and, and speak a lot of these uh, at these conferences, I'm often asked, well, what, is, what does it mean to be smart or, or what is smart enough? Uh, and just even if you walk out on the floor today and, and you, you come in the door and you're just hit with this cacophony of, of sounds and sights, it's, it's almost like walking in a casino. There, there's so many bells and whistles out there that you can kind of see. Um, you know, imagine you're a mayor, and, and you're walking through the floor, and you're, you're faced with the idea of, of what to choose from and how to choose. Uh, and so there's just this multitude of solutions out there 
uh, that in and of themselves are great. They're very impactful and, and they, are, they are indeed very smart. Uh, but I think this is where I'll point to, um, to something Kate said. I think what's very important for an innovation ecosystem is to have a North Star. There has to be a reason uh, to innovate. Uh, and I know she mentioned a lot of the policy, uh, the, I think it was 50 policy uh, that New York put together uh, and something we've looked at and something that Microsoft does is focus around the 17 uh, sustainable development goals developed by the United Nations. Uh, and the reason why that's important is because, you know, we, we need to measure ourselves uh, on the impact we're having and, and whether or not we're succeeding uh, needs to have a purpose. Uh, and again, you know, there's this kind of feeling everywhere I go uh, about we're not moving fast enough, uh, we're not being smart enough. Uh, and, you know, I, I usually respond back with, what's the baseline we're operating from right now? But more importantly, where are we trying to get to uh, in terms of being smart? And I think if we all work towards our innovation ecosystems to define some North Star or some measurable, it doesn't have to be 17, it doesn't have to be 50, uh, but that really helps drive the innovation and keep it sustainable. Um, and if you just even look at some of the presentations, uh, the complexity around some of these diagrams make it uh, very difficult. In a lot of cases, they're circles, right? Uh, and so without having that North Star and that focus, you're either going to get really, really delve into the weeds or, or you're not going to have that North Star and you'll just spin your wheels and be in that circus. Uh, but I think lastly, uh, the, the point probably I'd make that I see uh, in a lot of cases when we talk about innovation is um, we need to recognize that innovation isn't always about technology. A lot of times we must innovate in the way we're organized. Uh, the technology can, can impact us and cross boundaries much faster than our organizational structures allow us. Uh, and so two points around that I'll, I'll probably make. I think, uh, you know, as we use technologies, breaking down vertical organizational boundaries uh, is very important. Uh, but again, you know, one of the things a speaker said uh, yesterday in terms of innovation uh, is the job of, uh, or large businesses uh, are often too large and can't move fast enough to innovate, and we have to rely on our small businesses to innovate. Um, and I, one thing I would point out around that, I think uh, it's important to build on those, uh, on those small businesses for two reasons. One is, um, you know, innovation works best when it's rooted in the culture uh, of, of where you are. Uh, in a lot of cases, that richness of culture is, is in those small businesses. Large businesses tend to bring in people from outside of the area, but innovation works best uh, when, it's, uh, when it's built on the culture of the area. Uh, and then enabling those small businesses, one area that I would focus on to improve on is, is around procurement. I think oftentimes we forget um, these small businesses have great ideas and can innovate, and you see a lot of them out there. But the effort to go from idea into implementation uh, and the cost of procuring by government is so high that it doesn't enable uh, that innovation to sustain through an idea towards implementation. And so uh, those are just some of the areas I see from a global perspective of, of when we design ecosystems that we need to be conscious of it and be aware of it. So I went over time by a minute. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So by now you should all be convinced uh, that to uh, make uh, an activate uh, to activate an ecosystem or make it vibrant, we need uh, several dimensions, right? And these, I think, uh, these are the testimonials we had. But now we like to go from this ingredients list or the shopping list of ingredients to the actual cooking. And this is what uh, again this professor uh, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, and if I could have my slide, has put as four activation functions. Okay to go from these six dimensions down into the actual uh, uh, cooking of, uh, of a successful ecosystem in a city, uh, which you see there listed in, the, uh, in this slide there. So I'd like to maybe use uh, 15 minutes or so to engage in a conversation ar around, based on your testimonials, uh, out of these four bullet points, uh, what you could uh, actually say, okay? You see, the list is interesting. On the one hand, you have activation of stakeholders. I think many of you talk about this. We need to engage citizens. We need to get uh, them convinced about the need for action, to do something about uh, the city. The, but we also need alignment of the leaders. If we just have, you know, the citizens and the leaders do not buy into the needs of the citizens, this will not fly. Third, we need also an uh, extractor. If you have a strategy, it's nice, but you need to implement this uh, strategy for which you need an implementation structure. 
right, to, to operate these uh, experiments and to, uh, to actually manage them uh, along, you know, indicators and uh, measures of success. And the fourth bullet point is has to go from this experiment into the scaling up. Because you would all agree, we have a lot of experiments locally, but the, uh, the, challenge, and the challenges are global. So the, the fourth bullet point is how to go from this local experimentation into actually scaling this up to uh, resonate with the region, maybe even farther, you know, to combine these different experiments into picking the successful one and make them, as a startup could do, into a scale-up policy, right? So these are the four bullet points. <laughs> I'd like now to go one by one so that you are not lost. And um, uh, maybe to open a discussion first about this uh, activation of the stakeholders, right? I saw there are microphones on the table. You don't have to go, you know, uh, because there are four questions and we have five speakers. We would like, you know, each and everyone will have uh, like 20 uh, contributions. So, uh, I mean, uh, make it uh, convincing by saying, you know, from your own experience, what do you think is important uh, to activate the stakeholders? What are, in your view and your experience, successful recipes or ways to go around and, you know, and engage people, right? So who would like to say anything about this first question? Um, so I'd like to challenge you, Jose Manuel. Um, I often a problem that we see is that people want to, um, can I have a slide back? Um, is that the, the, the second and the fourth uh, work in opposition to each other? Um, because often you can uh, you can align a leaders around a common vision, um, which is local and peculiar to their circumstances, um, and that works against being able to systemize and expand the programs beyond the local capacity. Uh, so, uh, so uh, what do you think of that? Mm -hmm. Who else would like to say anything? Uh, yeah, in our case, uh, for example, our previous uh, presidents also said that um, this is what took us here will not. Uh, take us in the future, for example. So, and uh, activate the stakeholders. We have uh, this cluster view. So, this is one of the views that we see that can com uh, combine different uh, stakeholders uh, of the whole city of the country. So, and this is a success case we have. Yeah. So, I, I, I might I might take uh, number four a little bit and just talk through. Um, because I see that a lot, you know, we, we see a lot of great ideas, uh, but getting that idea through uh, implementation expanding is really tough for small businesses. Uh, and so, you know, some of the mechanisms around co-location or, or work share spaces uh, and, and having private industry and, and really public industry enable that kind of collaboration is important. You know, these small businesses have uh, uh, CapEx and OpEx challenges. Uh, and just can't do things like HR functions and, and infrastructure and, and things of that nature. Uh, but yet, as you know, government uh, real estate is a very high cost. Uh, it is a cost that a lot of cases is already borne by private industry and government. Uh, and so making that a space and those functions available and sharing uh, so that the small business can come in and work in that capacity to be able to scale themselves and not waste their much needed capital uh, on things like that is very important and, and it's generally what helps uh, expand those programs in local capacity. And what we've seen um, for these small, small businesses, many times they find, they solve an initial point problem and they develop expertise. Um, and if they try to build that entire solution themselves, they really struggle. Um, and so I think that there's a, there's a concept of platforms and tying mm. into broader standards efforts. Um, that really allowed the, those point solutions to be scaled into multiple, multiple types of, um, of solutions. In many cases, the categories of problems that need to be solved in the city sphere are pretty consistent globally. Um, how they're solved, so the, the challenge of, um, of bicycle to vehicle traffic interactions in Copenhagen, very different than Chicago where, boy, when it's cold, you don't see a bike out for months. Um, and so there's you know, very different types of solutions there, but yet the, the types of data, the types of, uh, of issues that need to be solved are consistent. And so for those types of companies, being able to tie into platforms using standards um, and using kind of common ways where you can customize quite quickly, um, so great product design, really allow those, at least the successful companies that we've seen um, take products from point solutions to broader plays, um, have really taken those concepts in, at heart when they develop their solution. 
And I would just, from a government policy perspective, note that we, we don't really activate our stakeholders, we really tap our stakeholders. The interventions that we do across multiple sectors are driven by the market gaps and market opportunities that are identified for us in partnership and collaboration with these industry stakeholders. Our goal is that our interventions have a planned obsolescence cycle and that the market itself takes over so that, for example, within the fashion sector that there may be a gap where emerging entrepreneurs need bridge loans to get past a certain stage of their company. We provide those bridge loans and then ultimately the private sector, the, the finance industry, um, takes that over because they see that these are valuable investments in high success rate startups within a particular sector. And so we typically run our programs on a three-year cycle and are responding to the stakeholder demands and identification of where things are not quite working and there is an opportunity for a government intervention and then we want to take have the marketplace take back over i'd like to move now to this uh, meeting point right between the uh, stakeholders and the leaders and how does this actually uh, translate into uh, structures i mean in your in your experience again what are the formulas? You know, should we get you know mayors uh, together as you are doing in the U.S. to create this coalition? Uh, I mean, these PPPs. Uh, some of you talk about these public-private partnerships. Is this something the public should drive? Is it something the business should drive? Or I mean, what is your in your experience? You know, if we talk about the st structuring solutions. What is in your experience the, the you know the, the, the models that uh, work you know best? And again, you can go in any order you want. I guess uh, I can just say that a uh, very important part of this is also listening, listening all the partners. And uh, if you listen, then you are hear different scenarios. And uh, of course, what is also important to keep the focus. So you cannot do just everything on a single day. So, And uh, if it uh, comes in some cases, for example, cost effectiveness, which is also important for some. So if you learn from the others and you uh, can take over from the others the best part, then you can add your part and then it can be something useful for you in a very long, long term. So, yeah. And I would add one P to the triple P, which is philanthropy. Um, we are seeing, and I'm sure everyone in the room is, that there's a lot of excitement and energy in the philanthropic community around wanting to support tech innovation, but not necessarily an understanding of where best to mobilize their extensive resources. And so I think adding that P to the equation so that it's the private sector driven by policy and that philanthropy is a partner at the table is the best way for us all to work collaboratively to achieve some of these goals. Yeah, I, I, I might just point out, you know, activating and aligning is, 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 is important and certainly listening uh, to, the, to our citizens is important, but sometimes they can actually help uh, solve the problem as well. Uh, and so, you know, there's examples where, you know, cities or governments, certainly maybe Estonia does, doesn't have unlimited budget, right? They can't do everything they want to do. And, you know, there's great cases uh, where, um, uh, the bus transit system in, in a particular city had a challenge that they wanted to enable bike riders uh, on the buses, and the bikers wanted to be able to get on the bus and not have to bike five, five miles. Well, the city decided it just didn't have the money to provide a solution uh, to get that done. Uh, but they had information, they had some hardware, uh, they had some ingredients, right? Uh, and they went out to the public and said, uh, and actually the local university had said, here are the ingredients. We don't have the money. What would a solution look like? Uh, and there were some very innovative solutions that were come up. A couple of students came up with uh, an innovative solution that was eventually chosen. Uh, and those folks ended up uh, creating a small business uh, and creating a service for the city to use. Right? And so I a lot of times we talk about listening, but it's also a lot of times it's a talk about enabling as well, too. With the, one of the problems with SMART is that we're often we're talking about a fixed cost that intervention with benefits smeared across... Can you talk closer to the Sorry. microphone? So often SMART problems need require a fixed cost intervention with benefits smeared across multiple jurisdictions or areas of budget. Uh, and so we, uh, we, we can only hope to achieve outcomes in the SMART sphere where we, we have an unusual amount of collaboration. Um, and and the because the collaboration, because uh, the, the benefits will be so 
almost smeared. Um, we need absolutely the, the um, citizen intervention to drive uh, the, the best possible set of outcomes that would never have appeared uh, on their own. And in many cases, these technology, the, the challenges that are being faced are complicated and require a set of skills that cities just don't have internally. Um, so we've seen a big trend towards service-based models where, where cities are outlining broad policy goals um, around carbon reduction, around efficiency, around performance-based um, agreements that then they give the private sector a, a broad range of flexibility to manage the implementation, manage the technology selection, uh, and manage the delivery of those solutions. And so I think that that is a trend that we've seen accelerating um, as the type of smart solutions that are coming to market are just more and more complicated. And to achieve the type of reliability that's required involves uh, a set of infrastructure that cities just don't have and can't afford to build just for that one, uh, that one region, that one city, that one municipality. Um, and so really by being able to tap into broader frameworks, there's, there's the opportunity to go faster and come up with better solutions. Good. I think we are now uh, uh, really ready to engage with the uh, audience, as we promised at the beginning. I have, you know, a list of questions here. Some of them are particularly uh, addressing some of the issues. So I think there was a lot of interest and there is uh, still room, I guess, if you want to uh, uh, vote for one of the questions or put yours. Um, so the first one in the ranking is to Kate. OK, uh, do business improvement districts in New York City play any role in the delivery of localized smart solutions? That's a great question, um, and that's something that isn't immediately evident that that's happening in, at scale in New York City, but it's something that we're collaborating with other city agencies to, to have pilots, and, and we have a, a program that's really looking at uh, neighborhood innovation labs as opportunities for place-based interventions with smart city technologies like sensors. Um, one of the programs that currently exists right now is there's a company called Big Belly that has solar-powered garbage cans within lower Manhattan, and they partnered with the local business improvement district to install those, monitor those, and now we have a wealth of data around the, the traffic patterns for garbage within lower Manhattan. So there are a small number initi of initiatives underway, and we'd like to really identify additional areas where we can at attract the sensors and look at traffic flow air quality issues in addition to waste stream issues. Well, the second question is, is more open, so again, you can intervene as you wish. Uh, what do the panel see as the major business model changes the data and, and connectivity will enable? So this has a more technology flavor, I guess. <laughs> uh, perhaps we will just see it, because in uh, 2018, for example, the first 5G networks will be opened. So a lot of data will come from this project and uh, this uh, what will happen next because you know before 3G we didn't have a uh, iPhone. So the major changes are on the way. You know, I think I think one of the things, you know, I would put out there and encourage particularly folks who are in cities right now is you know, as we develop more and more sensors and more and more solutions that capture more and more data, uh, the value of that data is going to increase and the market for that data is going to get very, very complex. Uh, and so I think uh, as we develop our cities, and again, I'll go back to my point about procurement law, uh, how that data is treated, the stewardship of that, inf the stewardship of that information uh, is going to be very important to help drive the responsible business models that need to result with all of this information that we're collecting. I just echo that. I think on a, um, when city becomes carrier and when city becomes owner of, of sensor data, I think there's some really interesting um, monetization schemes that can start to be developed. Um, and I think figuring out how cities can open up data, Glasgow in particular has, has taken a very liberal open data platform and um, and have pushed for basic and making data open by default, um, then how should they share in revenues and, and how should they participate in, um, in their providers, participate in new businesses that are developed on that, and also in the success of the companies as, as they progress. And so I think there's some really interesting discussions that will continue on, uh, on both data privacy as, as well as the commercial side. 
I, I think that's a great question. I think we spend far too long at events like this talking about the tech and n almost n n no, n no time, if any, devoted to changing business models. Uh, and th those are absolutely vital and will be an enabler. Um, I think one of the other things that we'll see develop, uh, we'll go from privacy and open 1.0 to those versions 2.0. Um, and so that we will see, begin to see a distinction between that which is open, and remember not all data is created open, and open is not spelt F-R-E-E, -E. Um, and, uh, and personal and private data, which exhibits a very different sphere, and then data exchanges, so things that were being see trialled in Copenhagen, where, where people can do deals around the value of their data to create better services for the citizens and businesses. Uh, so it, I think it's the richest area and most exciting area in which to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, I go ahead then. Uh, there, uh, there's another question, uh, which is maybe the one million dollar question. What is the most important of a government in the establishing successful ecosystem? So maybe, you know, what is the most important of the government interventions, I believe, in establishing successful ecosystems? So, so I, I will, I'll probably jump in. I, I think Kate said it. You know, I, I think providing that North Star uh, for the innovation around what uh, the government is concerned about uh, and, and the agenda of the government along with listening to the citizens. Uh, so in a perfect world, the government has great listening uh, capabilities to listen what the, the city or the citizens are stressed about uh, and take that and manage that into policy that they set agenda, that they set that North Star and allows private industry to innovate around uh, to drive that impact. I, I totally agree with that point. And, and I guess one other thing that I would want government policy drivers to get away from is this, this idea of something being either top down or bottom up. Um, I think that, that that very framework does a disservice to the type of collaborative work that's possible within cities and that citizens are not this other that has to be dealt with after the fact, but, but rather are the instrumental element that can drive, whether they're industry stakeholders or within place-based initiatives that there are citizen stakeholders. Um, you know, we're seeing within New York City, we have a goal of having 100% of all residences and businesses having access to reliable and affordable broadband by the year 2030. And that cannot just be something that's either bottom up or top down. That's a collaborative effort that is a public-private partnership, but that very much needs to involve all of the residents and businesses and, and neighborhoods to come up with creative solutions to achieve that ambitious goal. I also would like to ask that it's also uh, courage so if the government and all the other stakeholders around uh, uh, new projects uh, and uh, different other things, the courage is very important and also the common sense or the understanding that we can achieve it together. It's not only that one stakeholder is, is uh, leading or just taking advantage of the I'm, I'm, w I'm with the North Star. I think that's uh, valuable, but I think as alongside that, um, governments and cities need to pay attention to how they're connected to other environments uh, so that they do as much sharing as they possibly can, uh, and also to the environments that surround them, uh, because cities can't exist in isolation, uh, and if you overgraze the, the surrounding hills, then, then the river valley will flood, uh, and I think that's an important thing that cities need to remember. I put a final question from the audience, uh, which is also in, in line with what you are saying. You know, cities are places where people live and actually work. So this, you know, division of labor between the public and the private, or top down, bottom up, you know, is something we have to really take away. Uh, it's about uh, playable cities. You know, cities where people enjoy. Uh, have, with regards to playable cities, have you noticed any difference in the citizens' behavior or health? Is it too early to say? No, so maybe out of these experiments to create ecosystems, there are people that think, you know, that should make your city entertaining and, you know, and engaging. Uh, so maybe you can start because sure. you pointed out this <laughs> spotlight in your presentation. Uh, that may have been the, the jumping off point. But I think that um, what's been interesting about Playable Cities is that, it, so they're, they're a global effort. Um, and one of the, the goals has actually been to change citizen behavior. Um, so there's an example in Tokyo. Um, where they built a new overpass over a freeway and no one was using it. It would actually, it was a much shorter route to the other side of town, but either the population wasn't aware of it or they thought it was a dangerous route because, um, and so they actually, in, they added new, um, new luminaires, so new LED lights, um, and then also the, the shadowing. Um, and I believe they also had a, the ability to interact with the street poles. 
Um, and so it was a way to get citizens to think differently about their route home from work. Um, and they were actually interacting with these devices and changing citizen behavior. And so they were able to have a very meaningful difference in usage of that, um, of that pedestrian walkway. Um, and then it's also, it's just the, the first step. You know, these are very point solutions. Um, a handful of lights in Bristol, a, a, an overpass in Tokyo. But it starts to talk about the opportunity to make citizen spaces much more interactive um, and to provide a guide. I mean, I think that there's, there's an opportunity for great design out of, um, out of Smart City and being able to incorporate the, a design principle and a design ethos into the technologies and the services that are delivered is an important piece um, that I think is just being scratched. Yeah, uh, there is, uh, in our case, it's also that the digital world or the digital, digital services uh, gives a chance for people to spend more time on their own. So don't, don't, they don't have to stay in a queue, so they don't have to work on papers somewhere, but they can just take a really great benefit out of this digital world and then just, you know, spend more time with your families, with your friends, and do your own startup perhaps. If you want to say a final word, because we are about grabbing up, so please do so uh, if you want. Uh, if not, you know, I'd like to thank you for this and offer maybe uh, my take-home lessons from the debate. I hope you, enjo uh, you enjoyed. Uh, innovation is a journey. Those that would say, you know, you do this, you will have, you know, I, I think it's not, they are not saying the whole truth because it's a lot about experimenting. So we try to experiment also in the, in the debate with you and I think I was very lucky to have, you know, a very diverse uh, uh, panel. So I think we started uh, with you, uh, Kate, uh, you stress uh, policy drivers as, a, as an issue to really uh, uh, induce change in the, in, the, uh, in the life of a city and uh, how, leadership, uh, how leadership is important for uh, changing or building upon, as you pointed out, the, the, uh, the culture uh, and the capital. Uh, so that's, you know, that was a uh, very important message. Then Miranda, you build upon this to say, yes, challenges can also be a drivers for opportunities if you engage citizens to co-create right, these solutions. And then, uh, uh, Brandon, you stress, indeed, this interaction uh, about you know um, uh, innovations that can come from the periphery that you know that people can you know can have good ideas and you also stress the fact that not only people is important but also these global connections right is learning you know from different experiences around the world uh, then uh, uh, so Thomas uh, build upon this to say uh, you know Estonia is uh, recognizing you you live in a connected world you build a brand. Right? Or you have tried to build a brand, which I think you have been successful, and therefore how important regulation is to make this happen. Right? Uh, so you need uh, innovation-friendly regulation, which is what your country is doing, and actually then positioning uh, a brand in the world that I think everybody acknowledges. And then I think, Tim, you really helped uh, to really step back and uh, come up with um, uh, uh, some, uh, I think, value propositions about how important trust is, uh, that you, we need also the scaling up of these value propositions. We don't just need, you know, local experiments, but really to reach out and to provide for impact. We need this uh, orientation, this North Star that you said, but we need also to connect also these different experiments to uh, really uh, 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 scale, again, solutions up. So I hope that you enjoy this conversation. And I would like now, as we approach the end of the session, uh, to engage you uh, in the remaining uh, time of the conference with the speakers because again I'm very grateful that you joined and I really enjoyed so I hope that you also learned something from this. Thanks so much. Thank you.